you don't have to work into the night to do this. This is good enough. You're good enough. Your work is good enough. So, you know, where does that come from? I think if we message to younger learners, maybe any learners, no matter the age, well, it's basically impossible to get a house and it's basically impossible to get a job and it's basically impossible to afford anything. And then we have, of course, this like constant stream of strangely perfected lives on social. So it really looks like something that it really isn't. Like how many times do we need to hear the story of someone who is wildly influential or has wild celebrity only to be profoundly suffering? Welcome to the Braemar Life Skills Academy podcast where we'll explore the evolving world of education and student well-being. I'm your host, Mike Helsby, and in season two, we're focused on personal well-being, self-regulation, and innovative learning strategies for school and everyday life. Whether you're an educator, parent, student, or education thinker, this podcast is for you. Join us for insightful discussions, valuable perspectives, and a fresh look at the future of learning. Let's take that step into the future of education together. Welcome back to another episode of the Braemar Life Skills Academy podcast. I'm your host, Mike Helsby, and today I am about as happy as I ever am to be joined by one of my favorite people in the world, Dr. Dina Kara Schaefer. Dr. Schaefer is a passionate learning strategist, an academic resilience consultant, a public speaker about where learning, equity, and well-being meet, and is the best-selling author of Feel Good Learning on how to prioritize, focus, study, and learn everything better. She's recently taken on the new role of Director, Office of Student and Academic Services in the Faculty of Environment and Urban Change at York University and is adjunct faculty at Toronto Metropolitan University, formerly Ryerson. As if all of that wasn't enough, she is also the parent of three, and she is joining us today from her home in Toronto. I call her Dr. Dean sometime. Dr. Dina, how are you doing today? Hi, I'm so happy to be here. I'm happy to be back. That feels like a particular honor when you mm. get asked back somewhere um, and right back at you to, to dive deep in conversation with you about how learning and teaching is going and landing and feeling. Um, what a delight to spend this day with you. So thank you. I can think of no one better to do it with. Um, jumping right in, just to kind of set the stage, um, thank you especially for being our sort of finisher, our bookend to the three-episode cycle that we've started this season with, um, talking especially about the transitions that students, teachers, and parents go through at the beginning of the school year, their expectations for that year, and then how all of those expectations may uh, variously be, be either met or uh, evolved or perhaps uh, just blow up in everybody's face and become something completely different. Um, but I want to start with with you and your experience working at York and working with Awakened Learning. Um, just give us a quick update on what you're seeing, the highs and the lows of the start of term at York, working in the Office of uh, Student Services, um, and give us an update on what you're doing with Awakened Learning. Um, what are students feeling, experiencing, telling me? You know, it's interesting to talk about the beginning of the school year now. We are, we've just crested the halfway mark and the world landscape has uh, changed. Mm -hmm. The world was already on fire and is often on fire in different pockets and it is especially so now. Um, and so what may have been alive for students is gonna have shifted. There's gonna be iterations. And so if there was exhaustion present um, even right from or near after the start of the school year, we can also hold with that an awareness of the additional layers. Like, has any of us processed the pandemic yet? Like that whole mm. thing that happened. So going into the start with, a, you know, uh, an ever-present fatigue and now being potentially pulled in different directions uh, the somatic experience of divisiveness, fear, 
despair, hope. So there's a lot of things happening that are quite different right in this moment, middle or nearing the end of term, than we're present at the beginning, on top of which there's always an interesting rhythm to that. The way we start a year full of intentions and hopes and like this year it's going to be different and sometimes it's different and different from what and why does it need to be different? And then sometimes, as you mentioned, it falls a bit flat or it doesn't meet those intentions or ooh, those habits rear up or our contexts are really hard. Like, ooh, I'm also working. I'm also caregiving. I'm also welcoming a new sibling. I'm, there's so many things going on. So I just like to think about how layered there's many, many pieces when we talk about start of year or middle of semester. If we dig into some of those, you know, uh, I think there's like perennial experiences or perennial challenges. How do I manage my time? And of course, we can't manage time. How do I relate to time? How do I do all the things I want to do and have to do? And there's what on earth do I do first when everything feels so pressing and urgent? How do I take care of myself? feels really hard to do it feels like last on the list Mm -hmm. i know we're going to talk so much more about those but i would say that those are for sure um for sure the big heavies of what are always present for students and what am i up to at york well i'm trying to help students stay if they want to stay and what retention means and the ethics and care around if a student is admitted And all the way, congratulations when they are. And all the way, try again if they aren't. How can I participate in helping a student stay when it feels hard to stay? When housing is hard, when food security is hard, when understanding assignments is hard, when belonging in community is hard. And one of the ways I do that is by trying to lead and support a healthy and well staff. Mm-hmm. So that's what I'm doing up at York. Um, yeah, let's make sure we get back to awaken learning because uh, obviously they're going to play a big role, um, not just in a whole bunch of students' lives this year, but also I'm, I'm really looking forward to meeting a lot of the members of the team through episodes on this podcast. We know um, awaken learning teachers are going to be joining us near the end of each of our episode cycles to kind of help, just as Dean has done, wrap up and expand on and and elaborate the, the topics that we're trying to focus on. But um as you sort of alluded to, it's it's tough to say the topic for today's episode is going to be, what have you, resilience, self-efficacy, um, procrastination, whatever, um, when it's all happening at once and it's happening in our bodies and it's happening in our social contexts and our families uh, and our classrooms and our minds and our emotions. And those things are, they, when you talk about them, they have the linguistic dividing lines between them, but we know in our experience, uh, those dividing lines don't necessarily exist. Um, And so it's it's tough to, as you said, know where to start when when all of that's happening. And I'm gonna clumsily jump into one small aspect of it with the full recognition that there is a much, much bigger picture that it fits into. Um, But as you said, there are perennial challenges that I think every listener is going to be able to relate to either from their experiences as a student, perhaps their experiences as an educator now, or as a parent of a a student going through it, whether it's uh, primary, secondary, or post-secondary. We spoke with Rebecca Bitten at the start of this cycle, who's a a teacher at Braemar and a a mental health coach, who really um, raised up the issues of uh, student self-esteem and, and the, the related issue of social comparison, which is what's really come to the front for her as she's engaged with her students through the first two months of this school year. And it's not hard to imagine how those two things fit into uh, the sense of the body, the sense of the ability to manage one's time, the sense of where our identities fit in this fast changing and, and yes, on fire world. Um, I guess I'll, I'll just try to keep this as open as possible and not throw 20 questions at you in the, in the midst of this paragraph. Um, where are you seeing 
that sense of identity and perhaps a, a poor sense of, of esteem for oneself showing up in students' lives? Where does it come from? Um, and how does it especially affect that transition into this, this, the, this new beginning, right? this, mm -hmm. this transition without a, a real marker to divide it between what came before and what came after, but what mm -hmm. feels like something very new? I'm going to try to like find a few waypoints in. Mm. So one of them is self-esteem, which is such an interesting thing to talk about. And I'm very, very informed by the kind of compassion teacher of the world, you know, uh, Kristen Neff. And she talks very poignantly about self-esteem and some of the... Um, troubles that self-esteem has led us into and if we rely on talent or if we think i am i am better at this i'm so good at that i am so uniquely excellent at this the implication is that like other people are less talented other people are less and so i to be honest when i'm asked about self-esteem i really like stepping sideways not to be tricky here but the umbrella of self-belief because self-belief allows for what i find a little bit more like helpful or resonant for me which are the component pieces of self-confidence uh and self-efficacy. So self-efficacy, and you mentioned, right? So self-efficacy is this notion of like, I can make happen or put into play what I want to or towards what I want to make happen. So I can identify kind of where I want to go and I can kind of amass my toolbox, activate certain pieces in the direction of where I want to go. And self-confidence, I mean, I always just think of self-confidence, to be honest, as practice, right? Mm -hmm. We practice and we practice. And part of where that um, equating comes for me is the work around flow and Mihai Chicks and Mihai and the you know brilliant flow chart, because it makes very clear <laughs> from my eyeballs and my heart that like when our skill level is low, meaning our confidence level, how confident we feel about something is low and our, the challenge we're facing is high, that's where we get anxious. Mm -hmm. That stress that's too much, the stress that doesn't help us perform. So I, I put these two together, this sort of Kristen Neff work and this Chicksen Mihai work. Um, and that helps me swim in, I guess, what feels like a more fulfilling place um, and this notion of self-belief. And the comparison piece is, on the one hand, so normal, like, how do I know how I'm doing? Part of how I know how I'm doing is in the presence of the edges of others. That's actually boundarying. Like, sometimes I know, I know where I am in space physically when I confront, like, fabric furniture another person i can feel the delineation between me and another where it gets really tricky is like so i have this wonderful peer i have this wonderful colleague and they're doing school or they're doing career in one way but i'm doing it differently and the temptation i guess is to move from different like we're doing it differently to i'm not doing it as well or how I am doing it should look like that. Instead of if maybe we held closely this self-confidence, I'm going to build my skill and the self-efficacy, like I'm amassing my own toolbox, those learning strategies and coping strategies and all kinds of strategies and micro interventions that uniquely work for me and my way of learning in my community and my context and my resourcing, my upbringing, all of that. And so that's, I guess, I don't know if that's a useful constellation or if that's even clear. I hope it's clear. But that comparison, I guess, the, the salve or the medicine for me is if we keep reminding students, and this comes, these aren't my words at all. They're from a former mentor of mine. There is no one way to do university, which is to say there's no way, of, one way of doing school, which is to say there is no singular way of doing anything mm -hmm. and i think one an, one of the many 
benefits of languaging like neurodivergence is ah, like an articulation of the many ways there are to learn, the many combinations that we all house within us, which means that I can get to where I want to go ish in time with ebbs and flows. And my way is going to potentially look way different. Can I stand in that instead of expecting it to be different, wanting it to be different or seeing it as a problem that needs to be solved? Hmm. I, I ask questions about self-esteem and social comparison. And often when I'm developing the, these thoughts, it's, I guess I have a tendency towards deficit thinking, um, in, in these regards. And I, I so often find that your answers in our conversations bring me into a space of light and a space of openness, um, about them. I'm so thankful for that. We had, uh, we had a young guy on the, on the podcast last week named Arian who was going into his last year of school. And he said something so, so beautiful. He had, uh, I, I encourage folks to go back to our episode too, because this young guy just had a wealth of wisdom to share from, from his lived experience. But the, the line that stuck with me was, he said, it feels like we are racing to the top of the mountain, but who wants to be the last person left on the top of the mountain? Right. He said this, this, and I think his words were something like, this is a team game. Right. Like this is I don't want to be working my way up the mountain by myself. And in order to not to, I think this this young fellow, this 17 year old has intuited a lot of the wisdom that you just described, um, which is I've got to appreciate my my being, my my traits, um, what really switches me on uh, what I do well. And then I got to find a whole bunch of other people who recognize and celebrate that, but also add their, their traits, their skills, their abilities, um, to this team effort so that we can all stand in the sunlight together. Um, I, 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 I love, love that. that. It, it touched me so much. I love that. I'll tell you a, an enormous learning and that this is what it, it absolutely reminds me of. Um, it's like the richness of intercultural learning. So mm. I was a high school teacher. That's where all of this for me started. And one of the years I spent as a high school teacher was in Valencia, Spain. I was very, very lucky to have a year doing that. And uh, what led me there was my own history of bereavement and grief. And I was like, I need, I need to go do this thing called teaching in somewhere much more beautiful than Toronto. And I appreciate mm. many things about Toronto, but Valencia really kicks Toronto's butt in terms of beauty. <laughs> like the smell of, of orange blossoms, a real thing in Valencia. I'll leave it at that. But one thing that I, I confronted or was confronted by, so here I'm teaching high school, I'm teaching English, I'm teaching journalism, media studies, creative writing. And right before in the break, in the book deal, in the sandwich break before my class, everyone's out in the hallways and they have their beautiful baguettes with Hamon Serrano, like this, you know, lovely little nosh, always wrapped in tinfoil. It's like really interesting. These, the students were in front of my class, like in the hallway, copying each other's notes, copying each other's homework. Right. And so here I am born and raised in Toronto, Canada, North America, and I go up to the vice president. I'm actually watching this for a long time, but it's always the same thing. It doesn't matter. It's my class. If it's math class, if it's geography class, everyone's sitting in the hallway, comparing, copying, finishing, scrambling, and it's blatant. <laughs> like it's not even like I'm hiding it. So I go to my principal's office and, and I said to him, very smart guy, so, so much wisdom, American guy who had taught for years and years and years in Brazil um, and was now the, the vice uh, principal there. And so I say, how can this be? How can, like, how can you stand for this? Come in the hallway. We have to break this up. What am I, what meaning am I supposed to make? And he was like, Oh, Dina, like <laughs> have a seat. And he really helped me understand that here in this moment, in this place, in this school, in this hillside, outside of Valencia, Spain, cohort, community, and teamness, like being on the same team, to your point, is what matters more than individual success. And that these students who had been together in the school community, in this Valenciano community, 
we're not about to let any singular person be left behind, regardless of their ability. So here, my high horse about plagiarism and copying and what about the individual learning the skills was absolutely uh, dispersed, was like deflated. I had to understand much more about what's academic honesty, what does it mean to be helpful, what does it mean to actually support members of your community and the group to which you feel you belong and identify. So I'm so grateful for your, uh, your sharing of the anecdote around teamness, because gosh, it's awfully lonely if we're all just in it on our own and are so certain about our definitions of things. Um, yeah, thanks for helping me remember that. That was a big learning on my sure. teaching journey. It resonates so much for me. I'm, I'm remembering a, a specific TV show. Now, I don't quite remember the name of the TV show. I know it was on the family channel growing up, but we, we grew up in the same culture. And the the point of this episode was to um, encourage young people through the eyes of the protagonist to stand up to the kids who wanted to copy their homework and and have the the self-determinedness or the, or the strength of character to not allow anyone to do that because they're quote, using you, right? And I think this is a, a sort of common trope in our Western cultural treatment of education, or at least has been in the past. And boy, it's, I mean, you, you wish everybody could, could teach overseas for a little bit. I had the pleasure of teaching in England a lot of the same sort of um, cultural backing that we have here. Should have, you know, flown a couple miles to the South, gotten a bit more warmth and uh, maybe a good deal more uh, insight about these sorts or of things. Or orange blossoms. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that does sound nice sitting here in uh, in BC in the middle of November. Um, yeah, I we're so encouraged to to treat our education like a competition or like a meritocracy, and then you get out into the world and and you realize that that you really wish you'd developed your collaborative skills and, and your openness a little bit more and and seen it differently um, than you were raised to. The, the social comparison aspect uh, is, again, something that, that Rebecca Bitten uh, really highlighted and hit home for us. Um, I was very interested to hear her talk about the two ways in which um, she's observed students uh, ending up in a situation of low self-esteem. And they're, so, they're, in some senses, polar opposites to one another. The first being, I think, the far more um, intuitive for most of us, uh, a student who struggles with their work and is in increasingly experiencing a feeling of isolation through those struggles because they are unable to uh, express it, especially to the, the the teacher, but even to the peers around them, that I, I don't quite get what you all seem to be getting, right? It sounds like in Valencia, there, there's um, a, a bit more sympathy towards that student, which generates a, a greater sense of willingness to express. I, I'm not quite sure in this case. I got a lot of skills in this other area. Happy to help you with the science and the math, but the creative expression isn't qu coming quite so easy for me. Um, and the teamsmanship takes over. But here, the there is a, a, a real felt sense of isolation when you're not quite moving at the pace of the class right now. Um, and the tendency is to hide that, right? to fake it till you make it. So that's, that's the one end. The other end of it, which I think is less intuitive, is the extreme perfectionism that many of our students, um, I guess, feel is necessary or natural. They look around themselves and they, they say it must be 100% or else I'm in some sense failing, right? And, and nobody um, or very few of our cultural influences seem to um, intervene there and say to that student, like, there, there's no such thing as 100% understanding. There's no no such thing as 100% learning. And if the effort is to learn, there's certainly no no such thing as failing, right? There, the, It's been said often enough in a whole bunch of different ways, but uh, in many senses, we are chasing failure. It's, it's our best teacher. It's the fastest way that we learn. And yet, student after student, coming across, across my classrooms, sure, coming across yours, um, is being sort of beaten into submission, is beaten into this quiet, scared, you know, all, desperate isolation by either this, this sense that I must be perfect at all times in order to be worthy, or I am the only one in this room or in this setting who's not getting it, and I am therefore 
less than, worse than, et cetera. I'm hoping that, that those two descriptions resonate for a lot of the listeners out there, especially the young folks out there. And I'm wondering if, if you can kind of jump in and talk to us about, are there specific signs that one can look for in one's life to say, hey, maybe I'm engaging in some of these, um, these deficit thoughts. Maybe I'm engaging in this, this cultural assumption about what education and learning is. And are there sort of go-to first steps in the massive complexity of, of developing, developing ourselves as people, um, as you said early on, when you start taking in everything that's going on in your life and all the influences that are playing so many roles, it, it can be so overwhelming that it's hard to address the first one. It's hard to organize them into a, a set of priorities and start you know, doing the work. So if you're experiencing that isolation or you're experiencing that extreme perfectionism and you're starting to wonder, hey, maybe this is, uh, you know, uh, this is really hurting me, where would you start? Or maybe as from, from a parent or a teacher's perspective, what might you begin with working with that student? Your questions are like journeys. Um, <clears throat> where would I start if I was working with a student who is feeling isolated or hiding, layering over like a veneer of, I actually don't really know how to do this. I would not begin with the question or the invitation, go ask your teacher for help. I think that if we say that, and we often do as educators and as parents, we're missing a step, which is like how to ask a question, how to ask a question, how to ask for help if you don't even know what the question is you want to ask. So from a kind of strategy perspective, like what little micro, micro recovery moment is, what are the kinds of questions we could ask or that you feel comfortable to ask or that might give you a sense of clarity or direction around this assessment that you've been asked to do? So the reason I say that, you know, I've been involved in, I, in my role at York, I chair academic honesty cases. I would say it's the saddest part of my role mm -hmm. where students have been accused, not accused, we're exploring whether or not they have cheated, plagiarized, used chat GPT in ways that, that they were not, uh, that they were actually told not to. And the thing that I am certain about is that no student wants to be in that room and moreover, no student wants to have plagiarized. What are the factors that go into a student feeling like their backs up against the wall and that plagiarizing, copying, lifting without credit, generating material from ChatGPT or any other form of AI, that that's the best option? I want to get into that space. And that's I mean, that's not a far leap. That's in, entwined with that isolation. So I would not assume by I'm being helpful to somebody. Let's go ask your teacher for help. Go ask your TA. Go ask uh, any kind of person on staff at your high school um, for help. If if that felt available to them, then they would have done it. So uh, like this, exactly. the, what's, the, what's the earlier place of do you have a relationship with a teacher? Do you have a relationship with them? Do you feel safe and comfortable to engage in conversation, to ask questions, to begin to build some kind of bond or safety or connection between you and the person who's instructing you or you and a teacher you don't have this semester but used to or you and a teacher you don't have but feel like there might be some connection. So the starting place for me would not be a directive to ask for help, but to go like a few steps in between or before of what would it take for you to ask a teacher for help. I also would really welcome, and I've mentioned this um, to another one of your questions, is a kind of refusal, a practiced refusal to think of one's being as a problem to be solved. One's way of learning, one's way of being 
is not problematic. <laughs> we are in systems that make it feel like that's the case. And so when the system isn't going to change, we equip students with all kinds of ways. And I do this as a, you know, academic resilience coach. I try to like fill my students' pockets full of strategies in the face of broken systems. But I really try to make clear it's not because you're broken. It's not because the problem rests in you. It's because we don't want to wait until the system gets fixed because that's going to be a long time and I want to help you go where you want to go. So that's around the like uh, somebody, a student, a learner who's like beginning to cut themselves off, make it look like something other than it is. There has to be safety there. The other one around perfectionism, oh, you know, it's interesting to have Kristen Neff come up twice um, in, a, in a podcast. And that's interesting because I haven't engaged with her work so often recently. But her work around the language and tools of self-compassion are huge. And the reason that's relevant is it's literally the inverse or the antidote to perfectionism. If we detach ourselves or see ourselves as different from the whole of humanity, if we don't treat ourselves with humanness or humaneness, if we see ourselves as machines that can just keep going no matter what, if we see the end goal as like a, like a grade as a value statement that is a, like an identity marker, it's a worth marker for us, then we've forgotten the thing that's like hands on cheeks or hands on heart going like, oh, you're really doing the very best you can in this moment or given these circumstances. Oh, the, you don't have to work into the night to do this. This is good enough. You're good enough. Your work is good enough. So you know, where does that come from? I think if we message to younger learners, maybe any learners, no matter the age, well, it's basically impossible to get a house and it's basically impossible to get a job and it's basically impossible to afford anything. And then we have, of course, this like constant stream of strangely perfected lives on social so it really looks like something that it really isn't. Like how many times do we need to hear the story of someone who is wildly influential or has wild celebrity only to be profoundly suffering before we like divorce? Oh, just because it looks like something doesn't mean it is something. Maybe I don't have to like strive in that particular way. Um, I, I think that maybe self-compassion in all of its directions is the like singular, the singular balm for perfectionism because, you know, one of the branches is also, oh, of course I'm driven to work this hard. Look at all the messaging around me. Oh, of course I'm so stressed and I'm working through the night. Look at what the storylines are about what success looks like. Oh man, of course I run myself into the ground. Isn't that, isn't that what I'm supposed to do? All my parents, like my parents are burnt out. The professionals I look up to are burnt out. Isn't that just what it means to be a person? Isn't that just what it yeah. means to be successful? So Part of our participation is speaking to, naming outright, and modeling. I'm going to drink my fourth liter of water. I'm going to have a healthy snack. I am not answering your email beyond work hours. And I'm sorry if that means you're uncomfortable or unsettled, but I have a family. I have to rest. I have to rest. <laughs> I'm going to follow on my social feed uh, folks like the NAP ministry and where, where we really do radical acts of pushing against what it looks like it has to be, because it doesn't have to be, even if it's hard to, to create that space. Um, I think we practice and we practice in community and we share stories about both the difficulty and the small wins. Mm. There's so much there that, that I, 
I, I wish every student could hear and, and every parent and every teacher. Um, we, we feel like we're climbing through so much to get to the light, to get to the, you know, the promised land, heaven, the, the house that we can buy, the, the, you know, the job that gives us esteem and, and also some sort of work-life balance and all those pretty things we see on social media that may or may not be real, but sure seem real to, especially the young people who are coming up with it. Um, before I forget it, I want to raise up, uh, I was at a workshop with Dr. Shauna Faber, who uh, does a lot of work with coaching pedagogy. And one of the questions that arose was similar to the question I asked you about approaching um, these young people who are feeling this isolation and especially feeling as though everyone around them is making progress towards that, that, that dream and they're falling behind. Um, and Dr. Faber's message to us was, uh, as quickly as you can, as much as you can, please share your vulnerabilities with these students as their coach. Please show them that you also feel weak and confused at times. Please, please show them that your lives are far from perfect and that that's completely okay. Um, that this life doesn't need to be a process of sc scrambling through the, the assaulting forces that, that weigh us down, but that we can find home in ourselves in our, our fourth glass of water of the day, in, in the smell of orange blossoms, in, in you know, the hug that you might get from a family member, um, then not everything has to be shiny and gold and, and party atmosphere all the time. Um, I, I wanted to also sort of just characterize a lot of what we're saying um, through the eyes of the students that I was, I was chatting with last week. There were five of them, and I asked each of them, what is the specific challenge that stands out most to you from your first two months. Um, and at, at Braemar, students are finishing a whole term in that first two months, but I know a lot of students elsewhere are coming through the first half of their first term. Um, very quickly, the five things that came up uh, from those students was, firstly, and the one we've talked most about already, the isolation and shame from the fear of falling behind. Uh, but interestingly, connected with that, one of our, our Vietnamese students uh, Mary said almost immediately um, throughout the term, the constant reminder or sensation, I am Asian, so I should be good at math. And every moment that that was less than true, every moment that, that they weren't completely on top of their 12U physics class, which if I were to take it, I would just be crushed by right now. Um, they felt as though they weren't just imperfect or, or perhaps, uh, as you said, uh, broken in some way and in need of fixing, but that they were like a poor representative of their culture and perhaps the, their family and the, their gene pool, which was a really, really interesting angle that um, I guess I'm, I'm pleased that I never had to feel. I never felt like my, my ethnicity d determined the thing I was supposed to be good at, but I know many, many students do. And just another angle for us to consider when it comes to this, this self-esteem problem and, and the isolation problem, what's going on in the lives of these students and the minds of these students. Um, interestingly, the, the gentleman I spoke to, the, the, the young guys who are coming through their second to last or last year of high school, talked a lot about belonging and socialization and the constant need to be um, sure that they have a place uh, in the social life of their school. Um, they spoke about language barriers and the feeling that maybe even the, the clothes they wear and the haircut they have and the, the accent that they speak English with um, are things to be uh, modified, hidden, um, or perhaps raised up if they think it's, it's something that's going to gain them some, some esteem in their peers' eyes. Um, and then lastly, and it seems crazy to say for, for a 17 year old to be going through all of those different forces. And again, feeling like they're scrabbling through them, um, just to get some air, uh, they're learning how to balance several different parts of their life, including in some cases for the, for the 17 and 18 year olds, uh, very difficult, rigorous academic courses that will still determine their ability to move towards that post-secondary, secondary life with, a social life that is screaming at them biologically as the most important thing that, that could possibly ever matter 
right? We know that especially adolescents are particularly sensitive to the social hierarchies um, and not really having their pockets full of those tools to, to balance those, those enormous things, those things which, I, in keeping with Dr. Shauna Faber's words, I've tried very, very hard to tell them I'm still not good at balancing and still need more tools to do so and still need to remind myself that even when um, I don't get it perfect or even very good sometimes that I'm still okay um, and I still have a home in myself and in this world. So to bring all that back into some place where, where you can re-enter and, and sorry for the yet another journey question, um, but I, I do think it's important to, to bring specific student perspectives into this. Um, how can our structures, our systems, continue moving towards the sort of openness, recognition, and belonging that might make it just a little bit easier for a young person to be able to say, I don't know, or say, I'm scared, or say, um, I didn't have a very good day today, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. The word that comes to my heart and mind is ease. Those are a lot of tense places. That's a lot of friction. My, my shoulders are like up by my ears. I can feel how sh like tight, um, how tight it feels in my chest and my breath is high up. So I can feel even in the listing of what your students articulate it. It's like, I can really feel into that. And so when we're talking about systems for so many different experiences, they're distinct, they are uniquely felt, they're culturally rooted, but it's also culturally dislocated. Um, the one unifying thing is that there's like really some suffering, some grappling, some like, ooh, like white knuckle grip, you know? So when I think about how do I respond to all that? Like, well, now what? It's can we as educators and we as parents create pockets or opportunities for ease for our students? And what if we held that as a first principle when we assign homework and think that homework and amount and volume has to be there, has to look like a particular thing? Or when we give feedback, how can we ease the pathway to growth and understanding? How can we help a student feel more at ease in their body? How can we help create ease in that balancing or that kind of um, like the dance between the social pressures and the academic pressures, both of which feel so high stakes for students. And I don't mean to be overly poetic. I don't mean to be naive. But it is interesting that if I think about the word ease, like I, of course, want to get in there. I'm like, oh, my God, let's talk about expectations. Um, like, and also, where does worth come from? Like, where? But all of those are really like also scrabbly, scrambly responses to scrabbly, scrambly experiences and sensations. So what I really want to do is just like, I want to feel more ease. I want your students to feel more ease. I want your teachers to feel more ease. And it can't be all the time, but can it be more of the time? So in a way... We didn't touch on it now and maybe it'll come up sometime, but like, even if we take, cause you know, we talked about perennial and one of the perennial things that happen at the start of a student's year in the middle, at the end, whether their semester is two months or four months, or it's a full year. These like hallmarks, pillars, these rhythmic things that happen seemingly for almost all students. Well, one of them is goal setting. Like, all right, I've got, I got big goals and we could do it by smart goals or we could do it by stretch goals. Or we like, we could call it whatever we want. We could use anybody else's system of goals or we could say, how do you want to feel by the end of this term? What if that were the metric? 
not necessarily a particular grade. The grade comes as a result of a process. Grades aren't given. Ga grades are like a, like a match to whether or not a student followed the directions, you know? Yeah. It's not even about effort. Let's, oh my gosh, can we talk about effort sometimes? Like the mm -hmm. misperception or the mischaracterization of effort. Why did I get that lower mark? I put in so much effort. Okay, I could like go on a tear about that. But what if it was not a metric that I'm reaching for when I set a goal at the end of the semester? But a, how do I want to feel? So I want to feel more at home in my body. I want to feel like I am integrating this new culture with what I know and there's place for both. I want to become a more confident student in the room, like either putting up my hand in class. That's only one marker of confidence. It could be I want to feel the confidence of asking a question, bringing my own self, I, into a paper. It doesn't, what if that, like what if that were our gauge? And so truly, what if, easefulness not easy just more moments of ease in the fullness of my life which includes me being a student on this academic journey i don't know if i answered your question or responded to two percent of it but that's my <laughs> that's my heartfelt take on that <laughs> uh 100 and more i think and you've you've brought us to a, to a place of real center i think and and established a priority that, that isn't centered enough. Um, I think a, a lot of people's, including my instincts, maybe in response to a question like I just asked, would have been to throw as many tools as, as possible at it. Um, I guess you'd call me an X's and O's guy when it comes to the, the, the sport metaphor of it all, but... Um, but how normal the, is that, right? Like how normal is that response in the same way that your students are also having these like wildly normal, like let's affirm for all your listeners, all your students, how normal to feel the pressures and the competing ones. And like, but I want to do this and I have to do this and I don't know. Yeah. How normal to feel that way. How normal to carry our parents with us and our ancestors with us and our future hopes and what's put on us. And also we think comes from within. Yeah so normal and also a teacher's desire to fix it. <laughs> like I want to respond and I want to help and I want you to do better and I want you to have all the things you want to do. But underneath that, isn't our job as like one person in the room with another person and that person might be flailing a bit and we are also kind of flailing a bit, but there, you know, there's positional power there. Like there is a responsibility. We're co-regulating each other. Like my body I can do that for myself for a minute with all of the like, oh, I'm trying my very hardest and I'm doing pretty good despite all the things that I'm encountering. If I can do that and then my student, the learner, the client, the parent who's busting their butt, oh my God, lots of my clients are parents. And then they can go talk about feeling at home more in our bodies. And then we might have more space to go, right, what is all this for? All right, what are the sweet things about learning? Oh yeah, what am I excellent at? I'm not saying it's going to happen all the time. I don't say it's automatic. And I'm certainly not judging or shaming or in any way like condemning when we get, <gasps> it happens for all of us. We live this way. But you can feel the difference between rushing to friction and tension with more scrabbly scrambly and like deep exhale, where is there ease or where could there be ease? We'll absolutely have more wisdom from which to respond. We'll give more space for the student actually, who is their own best expert on what works for them, to discover or rediscover their own solutions. Mm. It's just beautiful. Um, the, the, the idea I'm going to take away most from, from this conversation is uh, what you said earlier about self-compassion and self-care being the opposite of perfectionism. And to, to tie that into what you just said about generating the space where in which an authentic self and per perhaps a clearer view of what is important to us and what is good about us can can arise again 
um, that's going to stay with me for quite a while. Are there any voices, any structures or systems that we want to raise up before we get out of here um, who are encouraging these types of thoughts? Maybe, you know, a, a lot of my growth has happened through finding a few really compassionate voices on YouTube and just kind of allowing them to their messages to continue to infiltrate my practice and my learning journey. Um, and by all means, I'd, I'd love it if you'd also include awakened learning and, and some of the specifics of your work there and what you're seeing with your, your clients and your team members there. Mm. But who can we, who can we surface here before we get, we uh, wrap up? Ooh, that's so challenging. Ooh, that's so challenging. Well, I will say, I am so grateful for Naomi Klein. Um, she, she speaks to how weird things feel. <laughs> it's really I, I grounding. Read, I read the shock doctrine when I was 18 and it like, yeah. I, I would say that was one of the early beginnings of, of yeah. my political awareness, my awakening. So th- what, yeah. what a name to drop first. Yeah. You know, I'm also really heartened by every human who Krista Tippett has on on the podcast. So most recently, this is so beautiful, Christina Figueres and her instrumental role in the Paris Accord and, and like all born out of her falling in love with the golden tree frog in Costa Rica. Hmm. And she went on to describe like the, how any moment can be dull or drab. Think about a student's life, how much dullness and drabness there can be one thing after another, one assignment after another, or it can be full of her language, spirituality, but we could say full of vitality, full of aliveness, maybe how I describe that. And she says the, the difference is the quality of presence that we bring to those situations. So I take everything I hear that strums that chord in my heart that like does that resonant thing. I bring it into my teaching and my writing. And so that has a place. So, I mean, that's one forum on being and Naomi Klein is one person. I've, I try to participate in social media for good. And so I follow lots and lots of people only really exclusively who bring together um, justice, the actual work of decolonization, unlearning, really punk education. If they do that, then I follow them. So I think Mm -hmm. about my friend, I think if anyone wants to do this in the workplace, if you follow evenings and weekends, that's, I used to teach with him, Paul Taylor, is such a visionary about professional process, like paying people for interviews, four-day week, transparent pay. I am so touched that that human exists and want to model and absorb and integrate. So those are very disparate places and people and formats. Um but that's like who comes most alive to me right now. I would say the people on my team. So I have a team now. I'm one of nine on Awaken Learning. And I, each one of those humans I've invited to be in, as part of this team, those folks inspire me to no end the way that they do learning strategy work, whether it's math focused or leadership focused or career focused. Um, I'm very touched by them as, in a way, my teachers. Um, I'm really touched by people who are busting their whole butts to, like, elevate whole communities. So I just did a workshop last week for the Lifelong Leadership Institute and the Leadership by Design program that Trevor Massey does, specifically designed to support Black youth. I did a two-hour workshop on of the transformative power of learning strategies. And like, we were just, it was like a love fest mm-hmm. beyond. I, I, I left it all on the dance floor, but only because this kind human Trevor Massey has a vision 
and invited me and I said, heck yes. And the students were receptive and there was total alchemy. So students are the place where I learn so much. And that's just not like an, oh, Dina has to say that she's an educator. I mean, really like every learning strategy I know uh, has come from, has been born out of students and particularly students who've been having the hardest time of things. And what I'm trying to do in my own small way is to, to make a bigger voice, maybe one day a national voice for learning strategies, which like I get our boring words put together, but can change a life because they change how you engage in the room. They change how you hear your ability to focus, your ability to do the things you want to do in a day or a week or a month, how you kind of absorb feedback and, and the hidden gems of that and go forward. And then the rest of what happens next. So I, I believe in, in learning strategies because they are fundamentally like equity informed, mental health informed and unsiloed, right? That's where you began, unsiloed student experience. So yeah, I try to do that in my way. I do that in Awaken Learning by doing one-on-ones with students, my team doing one-on-ones with students. I do talks and workshops and I love that stuff. And I try to support parents and I teach them learning strategies. So they're not like, well, you know how I studied and it worked so great. It's like, I can help you with other things than that <laughs> sentence. Because uh, if, you know, if a, if a parent is being met with a slam door or homework not done or all kinds of fights about that, I want to get into that space. And so I create communities of parent circles to be like, I can really sort you out with some like quick, it's like a quick to 30 minute meal. I'm like, I'll give you all the learning strategies you want to know. So, cause they're not taught in school. So I like doing that. And then I wrote a book. So I wrote a yeah. book called Feel Good Learning. Um, and it's a kind of badass book because for two years when I was writing it, I was told by agents and publishers, Oh, Dina, you're like the right person at the right time. Like post pandemic learning gaps. You should, this is great. Oh, you don't have enough Instagram followers. Hmm. So it didn't matter that I did my PhD in transformative learning strategies. It didn't matter. It didn't matter that that's my work or that, you know, like I co-created a national program, Thriving in Action. It didn't matter. It didn't matter that I like, the only thing I know how to do is this thing called learning strategies. It didn't matter. It mattered how many followers I had. So students, don't let no stop you. So I'm like, well, I'm going to get off my bushy high horse and I'm going to publish it myself. Um, and amazing. The feedback has been amazing. It's a bestseller. And so all those agents and publishers can shove it because I just did <laughs> You said it. No? There we go. Oh, On that God. end. <laughs> yeah. Well, Dina, thank you. Um, I know Thanks. I always feel better and I always learn an awful lot when I'm chatting with you. Um, folks, if you're out there... Uh, buy the book, buy Feel Good Learning on how to prioritize, focus, study, and learn everything better. Um, it's infused with the holism that you've gotten a little taste of listening to Dr. Dina Kara Schaefer talk to us today. Um, engage with Naomi Klein, engage with Paul Taylor, uh, do as my wife and I have done and make On Being with Krista Tippett your go-to podcast for those long road trips that I, I hope you're getting the chance to take when you get out there in nature and you know off the grind as much as you can. Um, any final words for the folks out there, Dr. Dina, before I let you go? Oh, thank you. I guess I would just say this. Um, one, um, if you want to do any of those things, like to engage with hopeful learning related content, but don't want to spend a dollar, I'm at on Instagram at Awakened Learning. Um, and I say that not in a self-promoting way, because like, oh, I got the book out, so it doesn't matter. Um, but because I take budget really seriously. So if someone's like, well, I'd really like to buy that or I'd really, that's okay. That's okay. Um, follow. You can. There's free stuff out there, which is I'm all for. And I think my takeaway to anyone listening. Oh man, final words are so hard. But just like, mm -hmm. what does it feel like when you exhale? What does it feel like when not everything feels urgent all at once? What does it feel like when you're in deep connection with one other or in community? What does it feel like to be fully, like full in the fullest wingspan expression of your identity? And could those be the barometers for how you're doing and how school is going or how parenting is going or how teaching is going? Um, with the biggest kind of the warmest blanket or being wrapped up, scooped up in this life, 
is very difficult with so much going on and so much pulling at us that the reminder of you're doing okay, no singular assessment or course is make it or break it, something else always emerges. And could our job be to be in like these encounters where we like soften the edges just a little bit? Breathe in, breathe out. I hope everybody out there listening is, is doing that right now and asking that question. Thank you, Dr. Dina Kara Schaefer, for being with us today. Looking forward to many more conversations like this in the future. Till then, I'm your host, Mike Halsby. We'll talk to you later. <laughs>